Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to yet another edition of Railroad Empires. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about seeing the forest before the trees. Um, so hopefully we'll get a decent little uh, dive in on trees and how that's going. Um, we're pretty excited. This should be fun. It's the last episode of the season, which I personally am kind of excited about. It's been a long season. It's been kind of an accelerated pace deal. Um, so without further ado, we'll kick it right on over to Andy. So I've had some strong opinions one way or the other that have uh, even sometimes been misconstrued. Um, I do have strong opinions about a lot of this stuff, but I, I also think there's a lot of right answers. And I don't think that, that my opinion necessarily rights supreme with people, but I often get accredited for kind of being anti-puffball. That's not true. And I think that's a critical discussion as a part of what we're talking about tonight. Um, I think the key to creating forestation, you know, to creating an entire, to creating a, a, a tree canopy. And I brought a module in so you can see it. I can break it. So creating a canopy of trees is a different consideration than individual trees. Those, you know, if you're modeling an urban scene and you have individual trees, they are, um, they have a different shape to them. They have a different character to them than, than trees. A, 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 a tree in a, in a subdivision is going to be much more apple shaped or rounded, whereas forested trees are going to be much more straight up and kind of out where the, where the leaf and the, the structure of the pine needles in, in the pay, in the case of a conifer are going to be, are going to be reached out. But if you're thinking about canopies, there's a bunch of ways to get there. And I'm not anti puffball. I think the use case matters. And I think that, that there's an era uh, related thing. And that's both the era uh, of the model railroad construction. I think puffballs were super popular in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, etc. And that has a lot to do, in my opinion, with the layout design eras and as things have evolved. As rolling stock and track details and structure details have improved so much or and, and other considerations and concessions possibly, but our layout heights have drifted further and further up and into narrower and narrower shelves. And as you get layouts that are much more eye level and you're looking up through the forest as opposed to down into that canopy, then I think puffballs do a, a weaker job of, of providing the detail that you're looking for. If you're looking down on the canopy and you're, you know, and you're going to try to recreate something that looks like, like this. Uh, if you're going to try to emulate canopy, forestation. If you're looking down into it, into a scene like this, and this is when most people who, who condemn my opinion on puffballs say, well, that looks exactly like puffballs, and, and you're not wrong. If you're looking down in a scene, puffballs do that job very adequately. It's when you start looking up through the forest, and I've got some pictures trying to show looking up through the forest. If your track level is cutting through the trees and you need to emulate this kind of forestation, Puffballs do a pretty poor job of doing it. You can strike a balance in the middle by populating the forest edge with some trees and some, you know, some better looking trees and go into puffballs, but you've got to make that that migration more seamless. So I think it it's a use case. How tall is your layout? How narrow is your layout? What scale are you modeling in? Um, and and our, our layout and the, depth, the, depth the depth of your shelf. The depth of your shelf too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think layout, I think all these things go very hand in hand and not to get too off on a tangent about it. But as your layout height goes up, you can, you can shallow, make more shallow the depth of your seed and get the same impact. So if you have a layout that's at 40 inches off the ground, three and four foot deep layout were, were quite common. But as our layouts have got much higher, we have found how much you can do with 12 or 16 inches on a shelf. That's entirely adequate, even for modeling fairly big scenes. That also plays into and the tangent I was worried about is, is the, the type of backdrop where if you're doing photos, photo backdrops and, and trees on a narrow, tall shelf, puffballs start to fall down. Whereas if you have a lower shelf, a deeper shelf where you're using a painted backdrop, it's about consistency in my opinion. So fidelity matters. Fidelity, yeah, absolutely. What is the fidelity that you're that you're targeting? Are you looking at a big picture scene? And, and scale matters as well, scale and proportion as well as modeling scale. 
some of the benefits I've said before in a, in a previous one uh, where I think of scale as a tool to depends on what you want to model. If you want to model Colorado narrow gauge uh, switching operations, O scale or S scale is great for that. If you want to model the Colorado Rockies in the modern era with big long trains, N scale is spectacular for that. And that also applies to not just the trains themselves, but the scenery. If you have this big, open canvas of, of, of scene that you want to recreate, puffballs start to do a pretty good job of that because you're looking at, at, at that and your, your artistry in your canvas has, is more about a big picture than it is down in the, you know, down in the individual trees. So I kind of look yeah. at it like, I kind of look at it like if you're using, it all depends on where your focus is, right? So if you're using, if you want your focus to be, the locomotives and the, the trains themselves and you you're using all rivet counter you know locomotives rivet counter rolling stock all this other stuff your your primary focus is there but then you want towards the back of the scene you want everything to be sort of blurred out right so there's where you would use your puff balls and your painted backdrops and things like that that's how i see it andy and i were talking about this earlier before the show puff balls are great if and only if you can make your scenery <clears throat> go up very steep and that's where you put your your puff balls but if you're if you have it at chin height and you're looking up into your forest you're not even going to see puff balls so there's no point in even putting them on because when you're at this height your shelf is not three four feet deep it's maybe a foot deep or 18 yeah. inches or 20 or something like that. And you're looking up into it, like the picture Andy showed earlier, where you were down at river level, looking into the tree trunks, looking up. Puffballs have their place if you're, like he said, if you're looking down, but then mm -hmm. a lot of people like the puffballs, but the whole trick to uh, fooling the eye is forced perspective. So if you have a large tree at the front and a small tree against the wall, um, in order to see that small tree, because as you bring your, 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 your landscape up, that small tree is going to end up the same height as the front tree, unless you raise it up even higher. Dramatically. I found dramatically. it dramatic. Exactly. So and, and when, you, when we start talking about puffballs, I keep thinking about that trick our friend Miles Hale taught us or told us about back three years ago at Amherst about using a thin sheet of plywood and, and putting down glue and just putting it all on the top there. And there you go. It's all done. Well, there's, the there's trees. another thing that, that uh, I, I, I don't even know where I saw this. You take some metal window screen and, and you cut it whatever height you want and you fold it into one inch strips so that it's folded like an accordion. So there's, there it is from the back. There's what it looks like from the bottom, but then you put ground foam on the surface of it. And in the background, that could be convincing because you have other trees in front of it. You have maybe another series of these things, a little taller, just in behind. So you have That's a variation. Cool right? And all it is is a piece of screen with ground foam sprinkled on it. That's a pretty cool trick. <laughs> I like that. Well, at a minimum, you need that even if you are doing more highly detailed forests through the entire depth of your shallow scene because, and this is especially true as your backdrop quality goes up from, from good painting to, to photographs, is you have to hide that meeting point. And unless you and, have deep enough scenes to roll the hillside over, you're going to have an angle. But even if you're looking up through it, you've got to hide that. That's one area because blending matters. The reason puffballs to to seafoam trees are difficult is blending them. But the same thing's true when you meet the backdrop. So that's a great technique. Right. For so this here is like taking a full coniferous tree and splitting it right down the center and put that flat side up against your backdrop. So yeah. that it's right there. there. There's no no added depth behind it. So that's I what this is doing. That's what this is doing. It's sitting right up against the backdrop. 
different ways of doing it. You, I mean, you can you can cut these round if you want to make them uh, deciduous trees. Sure. Um, I like the straight fire technique better because you could get three dimensionality. I've used, yeah. um, you know, scouring pad or Scotch Bright pad um, for that same technique for hiding that light, and I think that has a use case too for where it is. But you get more three dimensionality with the screen wire over the Scotch Bright. Well, it's easier to get the three dimensionality. And then, then you can get into um, like Walters is having that uh, build contest. Uh, and Tim received this package yesterday or the day before, and there was a whole bunch of trees in there yeah. by by knock, I believe. But they're all um, bottle brush trees, and they're made, I think, with the plastic material similar to this. But in, in order to make this kind of tree look proper, you really got to get in and trim it, like trim it brutally. Because no tree that you see in the wild is perfect. Not even close. Right. So I started to do this. I cut a bit off of here and a few other places. But um, th th these are the kind of trees that I have on my layout or trees this similar to this. I usually well, make other, my own. The other thing I about usually that, make though, own. Ralph, is that a lot, a lot of people don't realize this, but... The only time you're going to see trees that have branches all the way down is if they're right at the front edge. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. they're going to be completely bare except for the top quarter. Uh, yes and no. It depends on tree height. And you get these areas in a forest where canopy is a really surprisingly difficult thing to, to, to pull off well. And you've got to use photos. It's like weathering or structure construction or, or whatever else. Photos are key to the whole thing. But you get these little open pockets where you'll have a bunch of lower depth or where some infestation has taken over trees. So you need a lot of, uh, yep. of variability in your trees. And you're going to have some trees that are, you know, that are very much, you know, kind of wood sided that are, you know, that are kind of flat. And, and they'll have these areas that pop out. And as you populate trees up against it, the, it kind of becomes more consistent. So I'll just show you a quickly an area that I've done with these bottle brush trees, store-bought and homemade. And what I end up with is this. So the smaller ones are the the knock trees or bush or whoever they, they are. They're made with a plastic material. I think it's that plastic binders twine because it's, it's shiny. And you really got to do something to change it. So... The tall trees are handmade from bottle this this type of tree or this type of, uh, of fixture, whatever you want to call it, and you twist it with your drill, and then add your ground foam on it or or whatever your leaf material or static grass to add needles. There's so many different ways of doing it. So, just as a, a closer picture. You know, you go in and, and trim it so that uh, it's not it's not uniform. It doesn't look like the perfect Christmas tree. And if you're going to have a lot of them, you're going to have to have narrow ones. But you can see I haven't trimmed these ones yet, but they're going to get trimmed as well. So that's that's what I do. And what most of my layout is is mountainous here in in Canada that I've uh, modeling, so I have a lot of coniferous trees. But I think location and, and era, and not layout era, but actual prototype era that you're going for it. And you know, if you're freelance, you don't have to be as as precise with this. But the Pacific Northwest versus the you know the area in Maine and New Hampshire, Vermont, are, are dramatically different. From from Southern Appalachia or Middle Appalachia that I, that I'm modeling, that's those areas are quite different, distinct. The photos are are you know are critical to getting that right. And era matters, and that has been super surprising to me as I moved from modeling 1950 to 1988. It was very different in 1950, where they had clear cut forests uh, dramatically, you know, partly due to EPA regulations and and more wood products. 
but a lot due to the war effort because a little bit of it and steel was used largely in the war effort. People built a lot of stuff out of wood, burned a lot of wood, etc. By the time you get to 1988, you have densely forested areas that were open cattle grazing area on the side of a hill in 1950. So photos are important and you don't have to narrow that down. If you're a freelancer, you're bottling a decade or some period of time. You don't have to be precise to capture a feel, but you need a general idea, even if you're a freelancer, I think you need some general idea of the general vicinity and, and general idea of the era that is most important to you to be accurate about. Um, a couple of people in the comments and said, uh, or Erica, or no comment said, says that on my 1970 stereo up next to eight track is high fidelity. And the measure of that has a lot to do with, and that's why I think you're, the era of model railroading is pretty important. There is, is our ideas have changed. You know, Alan McClellan's, uh, you know, famous pronouncement in the seventies about the three foot rule matters. Um, sure. But our, our ideas about layouts have changed considerably from 1980 till, till 2020. We, we do things differently at our measure of the measuring stick of what is considered high fidelity or not changes with what's possible. You know, we didn't have the rolling stock. We didn't have the ease of uh, ease ability to produce photographic backdrops or to have highly detailed track work. That was difficult, if not impossible, at least at the scale of a, of a room size or basement size empire. Right. And then when you start planting trees around buildings and so on, just a little trick I learned from my wife, the gardener, never plant even numbers of things. Always make sure it's odd numbers, one, three, five, but don't plant even numbers. It won't look right. And I cannot wrap my head around why that is. I know that's true. I've it works. Myself. I cannot wrap my head around what psychology there is involved in that, but it, it definitively works. Two pine trees look rather odd because modeling Southern Appalachia pine trees are we call it rare. There's patches of them, but typically odd little odd numbers of, of trees are much more believable than even. And I'd love to hear a psychologist or something explain that to us, but it does work. Um, there's something there's something about the odd numbers being more eye catching and eye appealing. They do the same thing in food. If you ever go to a restaurant and you order like an appetizer platter, Count how many, say, mozzarella sticks are on the plate. It's going to be an odd number. It's always an odd number. So between you and your wife, you're going to fight over the last one? No, usually she just gives it up. I don't even have to ask anymore. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say she just takes it. No. <laughs> yeah, and Eric had mentioned, a couple people had mentioned some really neat tricks. Like, um, um, again, Eric had mentioned about, about using mirrors. I, I have said about mirrors before, I think using mirrors very well is one of the best techniques possible on a railroad that I've ever seen. Uh, but they could also be the worst technique on a railroad too. Well, it's one of those things that if it is spectacular, I love a mirror. If anything less than spectacular, skip it. If it's not great, it's awful. And I think that about various things in model railroading that you really have to hit a high bar for certain techniques to work. And anything less than that starts to, it really shows itself. If you, if the illusion falls down, all you need is a crack in the illusion, or in this case, a literal crack in a mirror. But if you have a, a failure of the illusion, these little cracks in your, in your illusion about it really become pronounced if it fails. And people like, Earl Smallshaw and George Celios have used mirrors extremely effectively. Um, I've seen it under bridges and Joe Fugate has used one under a bridge. If you, you need to make sure you can't see yourself in it, it's really critical to pull it off well. It's incredibly challenging to do well. If you do it well, it's wonderful. It, you're right. The One of the problems with using a mirror, and it doesn't matter who uses it, you're going to end up with the same problem unless you have the mirror finish on the surface, if you put it on an angle and something goes straight into it, you're going to see that 
it doesn't line up because of the thickness of the glass. But if it's on the surface and it goes in, it will line up every time. And like you said, you don't want to see your face in it, so you turn it slightly. At least. You have to be able to hide the edges as well. That's why it works good under bridges. And I think mirrors work really well in urban scenery. They're more challenging in, in mountain scenery. And I've thought about it in a place on my layout as well. You've got to get it to where you can't see yourself in it. That obviously the illusion falls down real quick. You you obviously have to have to hide edges and deal with some other characteristics. Front face mirrors are, are more expensive, harder to come by, harder to deal with, harder to keep clean. It, it has a lot of complexity. But if it's pulled off, it, it's a it's an incredible technique. But you've got to be able to blend it. So, and that has to do with backdrops are the same thing. You've got to hide the edge of that backdrop. In order to use a mirror for your scenery, that mirror would have to be a fair size in order to uh, convince somebody that that little bit of a forest you have here goes beyond. Yep. Because that's basically what you're seeing is the reflection of what's in front, right? Well, so I, I have this how... idea that you could use it on a multi-level layout easier than you could. And I thought about it on my own, on a multi-level layout where in a quarter, I have the depth in a quarter. I could have a valley going back and turning into the valley to have the mirror, and that would make it work. But it's challenging, and I haven't experimented enough to know if I feel good about it. I think small mirrors work well under bridges. I've also seen techniques of making a V situation in a mirror so that it does not reverse the image laterally. It, it well, reverses it, reverses it back again. But I've seen techniques, and I think you, Ralph, showed us uh, – pointed this out to me once a long time ago of a guy taking a vehicle, uh, cut him in half. And I don't remember if that was Celio. That's George, or, George oh, Celios. I thought Celios done that. Cut vehicles, put the front of two cars together. That, again, if the technique works and uh, in urban scenery, I think it's really true. It's I imagine that that's going to be a struggle to get right in, in mountain scenery and producing forest canopy. And photo backdrops do a pretty good job of producing forest canopy at depth if yeah. you and i think that's an easier technique to get right and with ralph's uh you know screen technique of hiding that 90 degree edge because if you get rid of that 90 degree edge photo backdrops are spectacular but i think this comes back to and one of the guys had mentioned um that they'd had a hard time making them look correct i think the problem that yeah cv railroad extra scott said that had a hard time making them look real they don't look real up close. It, it works at a distance. What I find the problem is the blending of them. And that's why using the, you know, the, the super tree material or the, uh, you know, the, the seafoam material, you know, this stuff, work, these work great in the background. They don't, and in an end scale, they might work better in the foreground. And I had started making some that, and these are just, these, this is like three of the crappy ones in the box that are kind of flat edged that I also, like Ralph said, use against the backdrop as tree flats, for lack of a better way to describe that. I've taken like three trees, flatted trees, and cut them up a little bit, stuffed them together, and then used some wood filler and some sawdust to make up a truck. Because the biggest problem, in my opinion, in the HO scale is these little skinny, you know, the little skinny truck material is not convincing at all. If you can get a thicker truck, that starts to be a you know, a bit more of a convincing, a, you know, a bit more of a convincing effect where this started to suffer for me was the size of the trees that I wanted to create. And if I wanted to create some, you know, some rather two scale foreground trees that really suffers, you know, it's really hard to pull the size off with just super tree. So for me, using these, you know, this distinctly foreground tree, these that are a little bit further back, this is more of a midfield tree working my way to this, and then just filling the area up with regular material because they're Constantly ultimately all made of the same stuff. So the canopy looks the same, whether you have a lot of these that are much smaller, or if you build larger versions of those, or if you use these, which are just the, the sea foam put on either wire or in my case, sagebrush, it's the same thing that's making the canopy. So blending them together is not near as challenging for me as going from safe sea foam in the foreground to uh, a cotton wool, which is what the that Woodland Scenics product or 
or whatever. And I just buy pillow stuff. They can stretch it out and spray paint it. But that it, it's hard to make that transition and it not be a hard line because it looks so different. Well, here's, here's another type. And we talked about this before the show as well. The materials you use. Um, these three trees are all chopsticks. It's, it's just a regular chopstick drilled holes in this one. And the material that was used for branches is called Caspia. Don't ask me how to spell it. C-A-S-P-I-A, I believe. I and it's, it's used by, by um, uh, florist arrangers in, in dry florist arrangements. Or they, but this one here is the one that got me, the one that I like the best. So I, I started using it. It's, it's furnace filter. This also is furnace filter. This was what I had left over from doing this. But if you pull it apart, you pull it, you can get some pretty good detail in it as far as branches go. That's surprisingly convincing. And I think the... You have the, to do it in layers. It's done in layers. But I think it works really well for for even foreground trees or midfield trees. And then if you use that and use the bottle brush method for your background trees, because I don't, everybody talks about background versus foreground trees. And and I think more about trees as a, as a range of trees from one to the other. And I have four or five different uh, major techniques to produce the exact same tree depending on viewing depth. Uh, also skewers work and you can get some pretty ridiculous skewers. You just can't get them super fat. So if you're making very large foreground trees, you, you know, wire works pretty good for. Uh, well, for the then it comes down product. to the other, the other system we were talking about earlier. Um, I love. Where are we? I guess this one. Yep. It's, it's using whatever size skewer you want. And then to make your trunk, you add uh, sawdust and glue and you end up with this stuff. And this is done, the branches are actually created by using wire. So you get this florist wire from, from the garden center and you wrap it around your uh, dowel or uh, skewer or whatever. And when you get to a certain point, you want branches, you make a big loop, you twist it in place and then continue on and make another loop on the other side and so on. Then you pull those loops out and cut them at the half where the, the halfway part is. And now you have branches and he, he uses a static grass applicator to apply, uh, I think it's about six mil um, grass, static grass on these things. And then a little bit of foam on top of that. When, and then if you use like the six mil, which I think is probably the right answer, then spray it the brown color because that six mil is making up more of your small branch structure. Then spray the whole thing, uh, you know, your brown or actually it's more of a gray color. Trees are a lot more yeah. gray than I used to think they were. And then you used a, a two millimeter green, in the, especially in the case of HL scale. And that works well, regardless of what your medium is. I, I think two millimeter pine needles is probably the right answer for anything very far foreground for concrete. So there's there's the uh, the sawdust and, and glue forming the, the trunk material, the bark. And there's a, that would be like a red cedar or a, a, a redwood. And that's prob the base of this is probably a piece of uh, uh, balsa wood. Probably. I mean, I've, I've done, I've done bases to my trees out of broom handles that I haven't made yet, the big trees. That's a good medium for that as well. It's going to have a tight, a broom handle is going to have a tight grain structure. So you can tear into it and still retain uh, a really nice grain structure. Um, I mean, he, he, this guy, this guy does all kinds of trees. He does conifers and, and deciduous. And it's all done with wire. And the trunk is done with the glue and sawdust. 
In some cases, he uses just maybe a caulking, makes it smooth, depending on, on the bark of the tree. I love his techniques. I just, it's, that's a very hard thing to scale up to, to do it very well, easily. Yeah. That's the other problem that uh, we've discussed before in the build show was all the manufacturers that, that we have that supply trees, none of them supply trees to the proper height. No, we're close. They're all too small. They're even not even o -scale close. Trees in HO scale. If you, you'd have to use O scale trees at N scale to be anything close to right. And, and like this is the broom handle thing, but this is not even to scale. If this was to be properly to scale, it would be another two feet longer. That's how big the trees are on the on the West Coast. But well, I think if you're going to do that, again, I think how your land is constructed really matters. Part of the reason, well, one of the, uh, another reason why I really love the the violets and, and you know, fascia effect of, of doing that is you only have to model the part of the tree that a human would see if they were exactly. in the tree. So model especially especially if you have a, a valance and, and you have maybe an upper deck. So your tree can go right up to the deck with a little bit of a valance in front of it and you don't see the top of the tree. But you can use it as a support mechanism. It can become a part of the structure. Like yep. I'm having much of my peninsula from all three. And if there are, and I'm sure there are, actually I know there's going to be a few cases where I do need to hide all three. You can just slip a piece of, uh, you know, something over top of that PVC or, or something that gives me a, a, you know, something larger to work with or drill a hole all the way through a piece of wood and while I'm putting up the all thread and make, turn that into a tree that's part of the structure. So this is the stuff I use to make my, my bottle brush trees. This is uh, binders twine. Or sisal twine works. Uh, yeah, that's, I, that's another, um, you can go to Michael's and get a product called I think it's called Raphael, and it's it's basically a, a meter long strip of wood, and it, they roll it up and they use it for packing. Um, these I got at the garden center. <clears throat> one's green, one's beige, and what you do is once you take it out to the size you want, you snip it off, and you can at that time separate. I don't know whether you're going to see it but you can actually separate the twine and there's two different strands in this one. So yeah. what I do is I separate it. I cut all my pieces, I separate it and I have a little pot that I put it into and I put hot water in it. And as soon as you put the hot water in, even with this, it straightens right out. Huh. And there, there they are on my wire. They're they're glued in place with hot glue. And then all I have to do is twist them. This will make two trees. But the, the key to like sisal twine or, or hip rope or various ropes for that is to just to make sure you're getting something that's not a wax coated rope. You get a lot of rope that is a wax coated exactly. oil coated rope. You want something that has its natural fibrous material, which is why sisal and whatever. And I've used something I was talking about earlier because Ralph was talking about some of the Caspia being harder to come by these days is, is this, this is a asparagus fern. Um, I love it. Chop it up into small pieces. Of course it loses all the color when you use glycerin. Uh, I use glycerin on anything that's not an already pre-dried material. Um, but you know, and I paint it and then cut the pieces up after I paint or stain it. And while I know I need to, you know, this is a little too, you know, a little too shapely. And this has not been static grass, but you can see the raw material. Also, I've not perfected the top of the tree. That's a technique that I, I've got to experiment more with that. But if you chop those up, they work pretty good for those rough, non-manicured. You know, it doesn't recreate a cedar tree as well as, as Ralph's technique. Uh, it does pretty good for Scots pines or a black pine, which is what's more prevalent in, you know, it's a Southern Appalachia. So... And if you want to see if you if you want to see what a tree looks like, go to a library and get a book on trees, just a simple book that the kids would have, and it'll show you the shape of the tree. Uh, somebody put out a, a a book at one point, just showed silhouettes. I I I it's probably out of print, but it showed the silhouette of every type of tree: elm, oak, 
uh, uh, maple, and and so on. And you can get a basic idea of what the tree looks like. Even if you go out on your front porch or out on, on a field trip, take a look at the trees to get the shape. Take pictures. And looking down through the forest, one of the best places that I have found is finding the places where they've cut for power lines or for gas lines, where the forest had grown up naturally, where it is native timber, and then they've clear cut a strip out of it. So you're getting that glimpse. It's not the edge of a forest that's been the edge of the forest along a road for, for 50 years. It's been recently a slot cut in that. And you can look at it, you know, that shape of the trees all the way up through it. That's what I found the best opportunity to take a look at with the forest edge because the edge that's along the track right away like i have here is is being that same edge for a long time it will grow up differently and the key is where sunlight water reach because i mean this is photosynthesis um one of my favorite oh, tools has been uh google maps using the street view you get back on some of the the more rural roads yeah you can jump into that street view take a good look and see what's what's really going on there it's been super helpful. Well, you could look at different, you know, how new the construction is. If it's a newer road, you get something that is, has not had a lot of years to adjust to where the side of the tree or where the side of the forest the exposed edge of the forest is open in sunlight versus a road that's been there a long time and where the edge of the forest has had the same sunlight and, and water access for a long period of time. Uh, Baloo mentions boiling toothpicks. Uh, to bend them into shape so I haven't tried messing with dried material uh, to do that with. Glycerin changes everything natural and everything that I work with natural that's not an already pre-dried, pre-treated material. Even in those cases, I tend to use glycerin. Glycerin will give you a, you know, like a one to three ratio of glycerin water. Not only does it, does it make these natural materials last, that's, that's critical for the long It makes them more durable. And it makes them rubbery. So and, so and even with the ones that are already dried, it, it makes them more durable. I'm going to put a link in the chat uh, for the wire tree with the wooden trunk uh, that a friend of mine did for the IPMS here in Toronto. Now, you ha keep in mind, this guy models in 135th, so his trees are big, but the idea is the same. So there it is in the chat. Robert Hudman, Trees of North America. Okay. Yeah, I have to look at that one as well. I mean, there's I can't a, remember I who it was. Books, uh, here, model books that I don't know where they are right now. I didn't think to get those. I should have. Uh, Gordon Gravitt, a British modeler, uh, literally wrote the book on modeling deciduous and evergreen trees. He has a, a really good book on grasslands. It looks good. I haven't bought that one yet. They're a little harder to come by, a little harder to find, but I've got a couple of those books. They're all wire trees and quantity is a critical thing. That's why we're learning, you know, we're talking a lot about tree, about building canopies and, and forests of trees. So if you have to build a few trees, wire techniques are pretty hard to argue with. If you have to build a lot, I mean, the sagebrush trees, I've built a little over a hundred of those so far and I've done something more like a thousand. Uh, even sage on that sagebrush of yours, you can still add wire branches to make it more, like if your sagebrush is leaning to one side, you can bring wire to make it go on the other side. But I have glued some smaller bits of sagebrush together. And in those cases, I haven't drilled a hole and run a wire between the two pieces because they're too heavy. So I've used wire as part of the construction methodology. Sagebrush is good for emulating certain types of trees as well because it has a certain bark architecture to it. Whereas wire coated with uh, sawdust is is really good for those i can't remember what type of tree it is it's such flaky bark so it's what are you trying to model the technique to get you there it's a you know i'm trying to model from a physics first principle concept where am i trying to get to what are the most basic materials that can be combined to do it regardless of how anybody else has ever modeled um that's why sea foam has been such a good technique for me for deciduous trees but i've used it in a dozen different ways so far uh, I, and I'm even looking at using it uh, the way Robert mentioned. Uh, Miles had showed us uh, using plywood and making uprights. I, I'm experimenting with some uh, some of the 
sea falls glued to uprights to basically make a, a backdrop that is is almost sheer vertical that's made with um, smaller bits of sea foam to larger bits and I haven't been happy enough with anything I've done so far right now I definitely consider that an experiment so these things here I make it with four 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 thou point point oh four wire okay 40 thou um, and that's that's what I use for this you can use thinner if you want I wouldn't use any thicker because when you get to the top of the tree it's going to show or you could have or you'd have to change wire sizes as you moved up that you know, well that's kind of difficult to do as you go on these things because they're yeah, it's, twist, it's twisted right it's yeah it's you, it, you it. clamp it on clamp it on your desktop and with your electric drill you clutch it in the in the drill and you twist it yeah that'd be pretty difficult to do now for making branches i do have a couple different wire sizes that i would probably use uh for making branch structure but for your core uh, for the core truck. That's part of the issue there is you need to, which that's why I like the sawdust technique is you can build it up toward the base or slide. I've seen Miles just make a, a bottom stalk basically to make the bottom part of it, everything above its wire. Yeah. All around the wire. Drill. And the other branches will come down over that stock. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's all about what your viewing angle is. If it's an immediate foreground where you can look all the way through the tree, you've got to be a lot more precise. And you also don't have to build as many of those things as you do background trees. In my case, right. I'll probably have four to five or 6,000 background trees. And I've built a hundred sagebrush trees so far, probably need four or 500 of those, maybe. Um, so scale is gonna matter. I big mean, the layout, you know, not the modeling scale or whatever, but the proportion of your layout is gonna matter considerably for what's possible. You know, if, again, I'm, I'm looking for a vampire. I'd love to see an immortal model railroader, but so far, if you're going to have if you're going to have only a, a lifetime to build a railroad in, you're going to have to work with something that's possible. That's another reason why I'm doing more urban as opposed to rural scenery. Too many freaking trees in rural scenery, man. Maybe, Especially but yeah. it's hard it to depends. cheat in urban. It, it's hard to cheat in urban scenery. You basically or urban construction. You basically have to build everything. At least with with mountain scenery, you could cheat a lot. You could get away with narrower and photo backdrops. You could cheat and use lower quality uh, trees in the background or, or lower fidelity trees in the background. I mean, I even use a little ground foam if the trees are really far away from you. But I use smaller leaf flake in the back and larger leaf flake as, as the trees get larger as well. You can cheat to get forced perspective and use lower fidelity modeling. But in an urban scenery, man, you're going to build every structure. To everything that's not on your backdrop. So that's, you know, and, and cost is a relative factor there too. I mean, structures are not cheap, especially if you start building them at scale. Um, trees are surprisingly cheap. And I, I mean, I'm growing my own sea foam. Uh, Ralph shared a video with me. I've already tried to grow it, didn't do very good. But uh, Ralph had sent me a video some, uh, recently uh, uh, for a, a modeler who was. Uh, you know, basically walk you through what had worked for him by the time he had done it a couple of times too. So I've only tried one time last year to try to grow sea foam. I'll start again in April to grow my own sea foam because I'm using so much of it. I mean, I've went through, I think, four of the large $150 boxes so far. I mean, that's 600 bucks worth of sea foam. If you could grow this stuff. If you can grow it, man. And and if, if you, the longer you leave it to grow, and if you if you plant it at the right time, you'll get the full nice full heights to them. Yep, and start early. Which, and I have not found. You know, they were talking about you know scale uh, uh, matters too. I mean, woodland scenics and, and others. Not to condemn them, I use a lot of woodland scenics products, and I really like their new static grass line. So it's not about that. But they tried to convince us for a long time that that's a tree at HO scale, and it's not. Three inches is a, is a bush, a shrub. Yeah, uh, you know, if you're modeling real trees at HO scale, you've got to look at your area too. If you're modeling the west and you're modeling three or four hundred foot trees, that's different as well. But in Appalachia, full grown native timber is ninety to one hundred and twenty or thirty feet. You know, that's an eighty seven foot high, foot high tree at HO scale is twelve inches. It's one foot. I mean, that's obvious proportions here. But if you're modeling trees, I you know 
medium by trees, by medium foreground trees are, you know, in the neighborhood of, of 14 or 15 inches is kind of the tallest right. medium foreground. Right. So what, what it comes down to, like some of, the, some of the trees, if you actually make them to scale, they may look way out of proportion. So that's where your selective compression comes in. Yep. But to have it the way the manufacturers are suggesting, they're not full grown trees. No way in hell are they. They're not even good background trees, in my opinion. They work good for, for some of the small manicured trees you'd see in urban environments. That's true. But, and I use, and it depends on how your land's positioned. I do a lot of, of track work behind trees. Um, in areas where I need to reach, in, in areas where, where turnouts and, and areas that I need to interact with trains and, and turnouts, I, you know, I have that open to the aisle, but there's a lot of areas where you're following the train and you're looking through the trees, through the forest. And those areas, the foreground trees need to be almost exaggerated large to, to, to create that perspective. In that case, I tend to be more scale appropriate. And I do, that's why I've got these very large 14, 15 inch trees. They are in front of the trains. Behind the trains, kind of the largest trees that I'm doing on the backside are more like eight or nine inches. They're not truly to scale, but like Ralph said, it's what looks right is more yeah, exactly. important than what's precisely right. Exactly. And that took me a while to, to learn, but yeah, I mean, I, I, it, learned, I model ballast larger than it should be. If you truly model <sighs> ballast the scale, it doesn't look right to me. To you. To me. And it, 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 it all comes down to the modeler Yep. and what feels right to the modeler. And you have to remember again, it all comes back to it's my railroad. So we're giving you tips on how to improve your railroad if you don't like it. Okay. If, if it's something that you are interested in, put it into the memory banks. And when you get the time, research it, play with it, have fun. That's the whole point of this hobby. Am I correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's supposed to be the idea. But and so many things matter. CV railroad angel scales. What he, he says, you know, a clear cut answer, which is the whole point of the last forty five minutes is, you know, what do we recommend? A deciduous canopy. It, it it depends on so many things. What you're modeling, or what what era, et cetera. What scale you're modeling in, how tall is your layout, and how deep is your scene. And I think those two things are very correlated. Um, but if you're trying to produce a canopy like I'm doing. First things first is super trees by Scenic Express or by growing your own sea foam. That's pretty hard to beat. That is that is incredibly hard to beat for most sea uh, layout heights. Yeah. Whether you're yeah. looking down on it, buy a hundred dollar box if you have to cover uh, quite a bit of area, save you some money, or try to grow the stuff if you're really going to do what if you're truly modeling Appalachia and got a large multi level layout like I have. Um, growing it makes a lot of sense. That's a given, and that's super easy. If you're modeling at a smaller scale, if you're modeling at end scale or something like that, and you're looking down from a from a level, you might get away with uh, with puff balls. But as Ralph says, and he's absolutely right, it's your eye. You know, in the end, you've got to be happy with what you're doing. And if you know, remember, this is our, it's a hobby. It's our entertainment. If at the end of the day you were entertained, if you were happy with your product. You're a success. It's the only measuring stick there is in a hobby such as ours, per se. But and, and then you can grow from there. And I, ultimately, I'm using you know sea uh, foam for everything anyway. It's just a matter of what additions do I make to it. Do I take in a few cases? Do I do I glue a few of them together? In you know to, to make something a little fatter, or do I or do you know this is built? This is a stick basically with some glue to it and not have any. Leaf like but you off. can add you can add sea foam branches to that. Absolutely, that's what I've done. It's a stick with sea foam glue to it. That was my maybe third or fourth technique of trying that. Or do you take sagebrush, which is my larger trees, to you know whether you take sagebrush or do you wire tree it? Foreground trees are a lot more challenging consideration, and we're going to get more into that in the future. We're going to get more into the you know very specifics. We've done a show on the build show a long time ago about actually how I make a sagebrush tree, how I do it. But there's a lot of techniques, and Phil uh, Philip Wyman has done a, a show on on his process of working with wire, and that you know he he's had pretty good results. He's had great results with that. Um, it just depends on how large of a process you have working with it. Um, yeah, CV 
Railroad Nation Scale says he has a couple boxes of super trees. Hey, he could drag. We'll probably talk about that in the future. I don't follow the manufacturer's suggestion techniques for that. I found some things that work better. For me. I, I'm, I'm curious what, why he says it's hanging to dry. Is it the way it came out of the box you're making it dry? Or have you done something to it that you're making it dry? Well, my assumption is that he soaked it. I'm curious to, to, to hear. But I'm my assumption is that he soaked it in my boot. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't have the space. Um, I just don't have the space for doing that at scale. If you're doing in a, in a smaller environment, boy, you could you could do it. But when I'm, you know, I'll sit down and make a few other trees in, in an evening uh, or, and flock them. So I found using a solder guy to straighten them, which I think Derek Glass is the first person I see do that. That works. Gr that works great for me. That's worked entirely adequately for me, and it's fast. How many trees did you ruin learning that technique? Oh, sure. I had you, you, you burn a few balls. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, I have virtually no scrap in the box because uh, I use all the little small bits to make up and to make yeah. foreground bushes and shrubbery. That's all, all that super tree material as well. So it's hard yep. to, to have much scrap. So, so let me ask you both this question. If you had, if you had a lot of trees to make, like you're doing a forest scene. What would be your advice to somebody who is trying to do this and get it done with a decent level of quality? Which way would you direct them to go? I would do seafoam. You could cover yeah. a massive amount of area pretty quick. And, Which and basically is super trees. Yeah, super you trees. Also, and you don't even have to straighten them so much because the, if you're going to bunch them together, basically treat them like puffballs. Use the canopy as you're pushing them together to help straighten them up or whatever. Put them in, glue them in position, almost like you're working with puffballs. If you look at trees in the wild, they don't they don't grow straight anyway. So they might start out on an angle, but then once they get going, they'll straighten out. So, and if you're putting them in, put them in, push them up against each other. They're going to force them into a straight enough position to be adequate. Um, also, what modeling season your modeling matters. I mean, if you're modeling winter and you can see down into the canopy, boy, you're gonna you've got to be a lot more precise. Whereas, oh yeah, modeling, <laughs> you're gonna need all the ground cover. Yes, and I'm modeling kind of late spring, so there are some some trees that are not as well populated. And I like the the spring era because you get some of these really bright green trees that are kind of popping out. Some of the trees, some of the pictures that I showed you earlier were were middle and late summer. When, a, when most people probably model, the canopy, at least in Appalachia, is almost perfectly consistent in color by then. I like the slight diversity that you get in spring and in fall. I've just I've just seen fall modeled so much, number one. I've also, I think fall is another, another one of those things like the mirror. If you model fall well or autumn well, it's spectacular. Probably yes. why so many people like it. Too many, too many oh. people don't do it well. And yep. it looks like a cartoon. And that's why I'm, I'm decidedly, I'm not as fond of modeling autumn, partly due to the popularity of modeling it, partly due to having seen it done poorly so much. Spring, well, and I just really like spring anyway. So What's that brighter made, colors. Absolutely. I love that. And I really like that dried grass with some of the new grass popping through and the, and the grass effects. So I think it's hard to be at where your modeling is going to decide this. If you're modeling the Pacific Northwest, I think bottle brush, you know, making bottle brushes would probably account for the yeah. largest percentage of my background trees. Well, like I said, this is going to make two trees because I wanted two trees that height, but I could have made the tree that big, that like one foot. Um, and made the, made it all with the same material, but I didn't want that. So that's the options you have with this. You can take two, you can actually make three if you're operating in N scale. So, and it's quick, it's relative. So and, once, you're and, up, once you get that spun up, you just flock it and call it good. Yeah. And, and this is what I got two, two, uh, clips here that holds the wire while you put the string on it. That's all. It sits there. 
you put you put the string on you come back with the second piece of wire put that down on top and and hot glue everything in place then it's good to go then you can stick it in your drill and twist it yeah and you set up correctly for that i mean i i like to do it with like basically a little i've got a small vice and just do it with vice or vice grips clamp down some vice grips to a table or something and you know chuck it in exactly. a, a little hook in your drill and... you don't even need 50 you don't you don't even need a hook in the drill you don't need a hook in the drill <laughs> you if you clamp clamp it to the table at one end with a set of vice grips and you chuck it in your drill here. You don't need a hook. Yeah. Because the hook, once it tightens onto the hook, you got to cut it off. Yeah. But if you I put think. it in here, it's just loosen it off and you're way you go. Well, the key to the thing is find ways to, to expedite your process, to speed up your process. You, if you've got to make a lot of trees, modeling Appalachia, the key to the whole thing is to try to figure out, you know, Henry Ford had it right. That whatever you can do to, to simply line the process as much as possible. Yeah. Right. Do we have any last-minute questions in the chat? Uh, CV said he was using PVA, basically polyvinyl acrylic, but uh, you, you know, matte medium is, is basically a PVA as well, which they I think is what they provide as a matte medium, but soaking it in glue. By all means, that works. There's no question that that works. They recommend it. That's manufacturer's best recommended process. I do think they need to be sealed with something. Um, I soak them in glycerin first. I do that with everything anyway. I, and then I do seal them. Um, but I'm painting them. And and I think one of the keys to working with natural material, in my opinion, is is painting them with solvent-based paints as a primary. Uh, That's what I do with this. Yep. Shot of camo paint or something. Calm, camo, right. Yep. You need a solvent-based paint, in my opinion, to seal it. And by all means, you can soak them in PVA to get the, or and you can use that to, to weight them down. Their recommended technique works. I just find that it's it's labor intensive. It takes up a lot of space. It's messy. It's it's slow. I, I found other people, you know, talk about other techniques that are just faster and they work better when you're assembly lighting them. And, and if you're painting them, with, if you're soaking them in glycerin to begin with, which I do want to make them last, but also to make them more pliable and to make them more resilient. Uh, so they're, you know, they're, you know, all this is kind of rubbery and it doesn't break when you have to touch it because you've got to touch it to clean it. So. Actually, you don't. Okay, guys. I'm, I, unless there's more questions, I'm good. <clears throat> so we'll come back to more detail to, you know, about individual trees in the future, but. You know, we wanted to largely talk about canopies for our last episode of this year. So this is this, like Andy just said, this is the last episode of, of this season. Um, with that, Tim is going to take over as the head honcho for Railroad Empires. And Tim informed me that his first show of season three will be in August sometime. So Empires is going to take a six month break. Uh, as far as other scheduling goes, Andy's uh, build show is also going to be picking up on its run instead of once a month. He's going to go twice a month. I know it's amazing. We could get him to commit to an extra show a month. Uh, but he's going to take over. From what I understand, he's going to take over in Empire's time slot. So that will be good Saturday content for you as well. Uh, looks like Johnny's show is the only one that is, that is coming up. I don't know when we're going to have a big bill show again, but hopefully soon. He's um, working on it. He's working on it. Good. Always working on something. So with that said, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for hanging out with us for an hour. We were only supposed to go for a half hour, 45 minutes. It's a good show. Good time. Content. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Stay safe, guys.